Yeah. So automotive gearbox. So we will be discussing today uh, in gearbox types, removing the gearbox from the vehicle, dismantling the gearbox, cleaning and inspection and assembling sections. So with this session, we I expect to actually cover up to the third uh, topic. That's dismantling of the gearbox. So cleaning and inspection we will be doing next day. So assembling part, as you know, it's not. I'm not going to actually explain one by one because it does not actually make a sense for you guys. If it is a simple component, I can actually explain a component like this. It's not a practical. It's not actually practical. Yeah. So again. Safety first, always make sure that you wear all the safety gear before you start working with the vehicle. So I have actually a question. I have a question. So first question is internal combustion engines need a transmission system with the gearbox, right? But electric vehicles does not need them. Why is that? I need an answer from Mintu san. Mintu san. Why? Internal combustion engines use a gearbox and why uh, electric vehicles do not need a gearbox? Oh, at least someone, yeah, here, can you tell me what is the purpose of the gearbox? What, sir? Sir. What is the purpose of the gearbox? Sir. Yes, yes, go ahead. Dushan. Intusan. Intusan? Okay, he's missing. Okay, here, what is the purpose of a gearbox? Yes, sir. What is the purpose of the gearbox? Uh, gearbox gives uh, different uh, torque. Uh, give different torque uh, to the uh, vehicle uh, in different speed type, different condition, uh, hill, uh, normal way. Like that. Okay. Why we need different talk? Why do we need? Uh, uh, we uh, then when we go uh, normal uh, normal road, then after some time we uh, won't go Kandu uh, Kandu uh, again hill yes, hill yes. area. That time uh, we won't uh, change our uh, talk again. Uh, uh, heavy load if heavy load have like that. Okay, yeah, up to a certain extent, answer is correct. So the same uh, this, the answer for this is fair though. The answer for why engine need a gearbox and the why uh, internal or um, why EVs do not need a gearbox is actually the same. So they have the same answer. Uh, let me share you a slide. Um, okay. Why gearbox is needed? Let's start from there. Uh, um, let me come back this way. Yeah, so <clears throat> if you sorry, if you consider a vehicle, right? If you consider a vehicle. So if you consider a vehicle, right, the force it need to move and the distance it, it, if it is traveling, right? Uh, okay, just forget about the vehicle. You don't feel the vehicle moving. You can do like this. So imagine you are pushing a desk, 
side you are pushing a desk so this is not a desk this is a box so you are trying to push this right you are trying to push it when you are trying to push it so i'm going to draw a ground how you actually what do you feel that's what i'm going to draw so when you are trying to push it at the first instant when you are pushing it, right when you are pushing it at the first instant uh, you feel it's very difficult to actually move you feel very difficult the amount of force you need to make it move so this is your force this is your distance right amount of force you need to actually make it physically move up to a certain point it will not move right let's say we start from zero then we increase the force increase the force increase the force increase the force and okay again we increase the force so we increase the force still it's not moving still it's not moving still it's not moving still it's not moving then up to like when we come to a certain force then you can actually feel it slowly started to shift right started to shift then if we still try to increase the force it does not actually need it after that actually it does not need any force without increasing the force it will increase the distance so first force right the amount of force you need to actually break it from the stationary position is actually high but after that that force will be reduced that force will be actually reduced the time when the distance increase when your speed is actually increased the force you need to keep the item or your box moving is actually reducing up to a certain level then there or not it's actually uh, continuing at that speed so this is basic physics for anything it's actually like this the reason for this uh, phenomenon the reason why this is actually happening is because of the friction right it's because of the friction friction has uh, something called dynamic friction and static friction so until you break the static friction you won't reach dynamic friction coefficient right so if you draw uh, again uh, i'm going to draw the friction coefficient so let me use the white board this time. no i'll draw the white board so here i'm going to actually draw a uh, is the friction coefficient so i think this is force Okay, this is, this is you, know, you get the idea. So, when we, uh, if we draw the friction coefficient, friction coefficient I'm explaining as added part, so I'm not going to spend time on that. So, when we increase the force, and it goes like this up to around here, right? Then it suddenly draw. and the friction will stay like this so this section right is progressively increasing section is actually the static part that's the static friction coefficient area right then uh, this is the dynamic friction coefficient area right this is the dynamic friction coefficient area so as you can see over there there's a small uh, like a sort of a drop this drop is actually created by 
the, the, this drop is actually the reason for this. Uh, we have to increase up to the, uh, we have to increase our force up to until it's actually breaking out, breaking out from that static, uh, static friction coefficient. So until then we have to actually increase, then it started to go down up to a certain point and it will continue. So this small section is the reason for this particular graph, right? This particular graph is actually created by this small drop over here. Okay, so once we consider this, then we actually have something like the one actually shown in below. So driving force has to be uh, the one we actually discussed is actually shown in the red color graph. But if you consider the power output and the torque of a particular normal vehicle, is actually coming similar to the one actually shown on the top, the top graph. So this is, so power and torque graph. So this is the torque and power graph of a typical vehicle. This is not the ideal case. This is not the best way. So what you have to remember is internal combustion engines or these uh, piston engines or reciprocating engines, especially reciprocating engines are inherently problematic. Right, inherently problematic, but because of their problems, only we actually come up with the uh, torque and power curve similar to this. So this torque convert, this torque, uh, this torque curve is not actually going to match with our force requirements. Right, so torque means force into distance, newton meters. So the that's how the force is actually applied on the uh, ground. Let me, I'm expecting you can understand this, right? So, uh, because of that, we have to use a gearbox in order to shift this torque curve into different positions of the graph, of the force requirement, driving force graph to match right to match that's why we actually use a gearbox so gearbox when we change the speed it will increase the, if we reduce the speed it will increase the torque then it will be moving up uh, it will increase the torque so we can use that uh, particular part of the torque curve to cover a section of the driving force which is shown in the first gear in the second gear it's say done in the same way third gear also it's done in the same way fourth gear it's also done in the same way so that's why we actually have to use a gearbox. So I think you have learned this one in your class, in your automobile foundation, in automobile technology module, you should have actually learned this. I will laugh from so I taught this me usually. I used to teach this because of my lot of works only, he will start teaching this. And I know sir actually taught this because I have his lecture notes. I saw it's there in, is lecture notes and uh, you should remember these sort of small details and uh, next time if you say I don't know something I'm going to throw you out from the class so give at least some answer um, yeah so that's why gearboxes is needed right and the reason electric vehicles do not need a gearbox is uh, their gear their torque output is very much similar to this curve Right? It's actually the ideally same. So same graph, same uh, force of same torque output is there. So it can be usually, it can be used without any trouble, no need of a gearbox, but still they need a, a reduction gear in order to match the wheel speeds because they are run, uh, rotating at a very high RPM. So in order to match the RPMs or in order to uh, reduce the RPM only, they actually need a reduction gear. So, another fact about this gearbox is top fuel dragsters are actually known as a type of a race car. It's the fastest accelerating vehicle on the earth. There's not such thing. It's actually a car which can go over 300 miles per hour within like four or five seconds. Less than five seconds, they reach over 300 
miles per hour, 300 miles per hour means something. I don't know how many kilometers per hour you have to increase by 1.6 or something. So then um, these the vehicles in these actually have you know, these vehicles actually you produce around uh, 10,000 horsepower, right? These are usually internal combustion reciprocating engines, but produce around 10,000 horsepower. But still, they don't use a cooling system. They do not use a gearbox, right? And somehow they manage to reach this um, mileage. So it's very in, uh, interesting engineering and technology, automatic technology is actually behind this. I suggest you to you watch these two videos to understand these things, how these particular vehicles are actually uh, running at this high speed without any uh, gearbox. Okay, so transmission has to be classified. The classification of transmission is very difficult. There are so many types of transmission that I did not actually include it here. Right? There are so many types of transmissions that are there. I'm just trying to discuss very simple transmissions here, which are available in usually available in most of the day-to-day -day vehicles. So transmission, we can actually, as we all know, goes into manual and automatic. So or manual gearboxes or transmission. So note that I'm using the word transmission instead of gearbox here as much as possible, right? Let me, I will explain it later. So uh, I think next few slides later, I will be explaining why transmission and why gearbox people. And there's a difference between transmission and gearbox. So manual transmission and automatic transmissions are there. So in manual transmission, we have H pattern manual transmission and automated manual transmission. And in the automatic transmission, planetary gear drive, also the conventional manual uh, automatic gearbox, automatic transmission and the uh, continuous variable uh, transmission. So in H pattern manual transmission means the usual manual transmission where we change the gears similar to a H shape. So our shifter movement is actually similar to a H letter. And automated manual transmission is uh, exact, it's it's actually a manual transmission, right? It's actually a manual transmission with a fully automated system inside. So it actually has all the components in the clutch, uh, clutch and the gearboxes are, if you completely disassemble it, it's actually inside is completely a manual transmission, but the clutch and the gear transmission or gear selecting mechanism is automated. So it's actually a manual transmission. Uh, planetary gear type automated transmission, automatic transmission is a fluid coupling or torque converter is actually there. So it's actually provide fluid into the transmission system and it uses a, a cleverly designed, uh, cleverly designed uh, sort of like channels with uh, pressure switches to control which gear has the vehicle or vehicle has to be in. So based on the oil pressure, it's actually changing the gear. In the continuous variable uh, transmission type, instead of using gear wheels, it's actually using a belt driven type. So there's a belt with, it's actually having a V belt with two pulleys that pushing against it and uh, by changing the diameter of the belt, it's uh, possible to uh, come up with different uh, gear, uh, sorry, the different uh, gear ratio. So in addition to this, there's like uh, dog boxes, there's like um, sequential transmissions, there's sequential manuals, there's sequential automatics, there's dual clutch, this and that, so many types are there, but more, all, most all of them can be actually included into one or another one of these transmission system. So that's why I put like this and these are the most common ones available in the market, right? Uh, so this is, uh, it's important to know what sort of a transmission is there because so uh, what sort of a auto man or automatic transmission or a manual transmission, or if it is a manual transmission, what is, a, uh, if it is a manual transmission, what is automatic, automated manual transmission, this man's thing and assembling processes, so somewhat different from a usual manual transmission, same for the automatic transmission as well. So,
yeah so in addition to that in addition to these classifications then we come to classification of something like where the transmission is going to be usually transmission is directly bolded to the uh, engine itself but in some instances instances it's not like that right it's not like that uh, let me discuss so uh, based on the engineering of the whole vehicle and where the components are uh, we can actually uh, package right package transmission uh, in two different ways one is the conventional transmission where you have a transmission alone that means the gearbox let's say again i will use the gearbox uh, term here but it's not the correct term gearbox term uh, gearbox separate which is directly bolted to the uh, engine itself but in addition to that there's something called a trans axle trans axle means uh, the gearbox and the transmission right sorry gearbox and the axle gearbox and the axle is actually assembled into one house this sort of uh, arrangement is actually known as a trans axle so in front wheel uh, front engine front wheel drive vehicles they actually use a trans axle where gearbox and the differential and the axle are actually housed in a one single component right that's what actually shown in the image so this is the trans axle so this section of the engine so this section of the gearbox so trans axle is actually the transmission part and this is the axle part. so these are actually known as trans axle so adding a trans axle is very beneficial for a vehicle because it reduces the number of parts needed it reduces the weight and it reduces the space necessary in addition to that this is the front wheel front in, front engine front wheel drive trans axle but there is something called front engine rear wheel drive so usually in a front engine rear wheel drive we have engine transmission then we have propeller shaft going and then only we have the axles but for specifically specifically mostly at least mostly for weight balancing purposes in some cases the manufacturers move the gearbox from front of the vehicle or uh, back of the engine to the uh back of the vehicle so that means you have a engine then you don't have a propeller shaft in the propeller shaft location you have something called torque tube then the torque tube is connected to the trans axle so this is a trans axle so the transmission is actually housed in here not over here transmission is actually here so transmission is housed inside so inside the trans uh, trans axle is some uh, very much similar to the normal uh, transmission everything is there uh, the difference between this sort of arrangement the main uh, requirement of this arrangement uh, means to use this arrangement for to achieve in this 50 50 weight balance so you have a 50 50 weight balance means between the front and the rear of the vehicle right front and the rear of the vehicle if it can actually achieve 50 50 weight balance then the vehicle is very controllable for example uh, let me give a very simple example if you consider a double cab or a pickup truck right you have a engine and the cabin and the rear of the vehicle there's nothing even in a tipper or lorry or something um, like a normal uh, flatbed truck or something there's nothing on the rear so the rear of the vehicle is very loose so you can't actually control it it's very hard to control in such case uh, at high speeds but uh, for a high performance car like this it's not a uh, it's not the best uh, best characteristic to have so in such case manufacturers move the gearbox to the back in order to get the 50 50 weight balance to keep the vehicle under control very well so uh, in these vehicles they use something called a torque tube the torque tube is uh, directly bolting the gearbox up to the uh, transmission the difference main difference between the torque tube is the exact Uh, engine torque or engine torque and power will be delivered to the uh, trans axle. So there's no U joints or anything used. It's a direct shaft that's joining these two because uh, unlike in a unlike in a normal uh, propeller shaft where it needs to actually have a, a flexibility, this does not need to have flexibility because this actually acts as a one rigid component, right? so 
this is also available. This is actually known as a transaction. So the image actually shown here is actually from uh, SLS AMG vehicle. Uh, so SLS AMG actually use this uh, type of uh, I mean, not only this, there's a lot of high performance or so performance cars or GT cars actually use this to save weight and make sure the vehicle is having very good, not exactly to save the weight, but to uh, get very good 50-50 weight distribution. Okay, now we come to the difference between the power transmission and the gearbox. So gearbox, we usually call these whole components. This is a, uh, if we go to anybody and ask, even if I ask any of you, you will say this is a gearbox. This is not the gearbox section. This is the transmission, right? Transmission is the uh, assemble of components, which including the gearbox. So if we start from the front of this transmission, which is this side, right? This is the front of the transmission. So first section, we call it this part as the bell housing, right? Second part of the this part as the gearbox and the third part as the extension house, right? So the engine is actually bolted to the bell housing through these holes over here. Like these are the holes which are actually bolted into the gearbox. So uh, the difference between the gearbox is transmission is, as I told you, it's a com combination of components. So only this section is actually the gearbox part. So this is the gearbox section as shown here. Gearbox houses the gears and gear sets. So this actually houses the gear set. Gearbox is actually only contain the gears, right? And the front part, bell housing. Bell housing actually hold the gearbox. So it's assemble the gearbox up to the, or oh, it's keep the gearbox aligned with the uh, engine itself while, while creating a non-permanent coupling. The clutch or uh, Converter which houses inside, which uh, sits inside this bell housing, is actually creating a non permanent coupling. So it's actually coupled together, but it's not come non -com uh, permanent or oh, at any time it can be disconnected. That's why it's actually there. The reason for the whole reason to be there is, is to be disconnected and uh, connected and necessary, right? Then you have something called this extension housing. Part. So, this is the thing you have to understand. For any manufacturer, for any given manufacturer, right? The reason they are doing it is for when they are manufacturing, they don't do a whole part, a whole section as one assembly because of the manufacturing easiness to reduce the cost. This is the reason for uh, any gearbox. If you consider any gearbox, let's say. Uh, W58, W58 is a Toyota gearbox. So W58 gearbox, they do not only use in any single vehicle, they are using it in different vehicles, right? So the gearbox is actually designed to use in different applications, different engines, right? Sometimes it's used with the three liter engine, four liter engine, five liter engines, right? So when they are using different engines, different applications, right? different bell housings they have to use, right? And different extension housings they have to use. So they can actually use different extension housing and different bell housing, and they can couple different gearbox, different engines into the same gearbox if they, if they use this particular arrangement, right? Because different engines have different requirements. For example, some engines actually have intake from the right side and exhaust from the rear left side. Some have actually intake and exhaust both from the right side of the engine. So in such case, you actually have to move the clutch fork or they have to move the uh, starter motor from left side to right side to uh, reduce the temperature around the starter motor. Right? When you do such things, you actually have to have the flexibility. So in order to have this flexibility on you, transmission is made with three components. So front you can, you have the bell housing, different bell housing can be used to couple the gearbox with different engines. But in the back, in the back, the whole uh, story is completely different. In the back, in the extension housing, inside the extension housing, you actually have the output shaft, which is actually over here. This is the extension housing. 
this is where your propeller shaft or drive shaft or whatever is actually coming into contact. In addition to that, after all the transmission calculations were done, all the transmission uh, or gear changes have been done, the final drive, final output from the gearbox is actually coming from here. So this is the only place or this is the most suitable place to uh, get the vehicle speed. So that's why the speed sensor is actually uh, housed inside here. In addition to that, right? In addition to that, most of the time gear changing mechanism is sometimes, not most of the time, sometimes gear changing mechanism, if it is a front engine rear wheel drive, right? If it is a front engine rear wheel drive, since this is actually a manual automatic gearbox, but in the front engine, in most of the front engine rear wheel drive uh, vehicles, uh, they actually used. Sorry, this is not. They have a small section like this. I will say there's another image of that later. It's extension housing shape is somewhat like that. So your gear changer is actually coming from here. Shifter lever, your shifting device coming from the extension house, right? That's one reason to have the extension house like this. And if this, so for the same vehicle, sometimes it's come as a rear wheel drive car, sometimes it's come with a four wheel drive car. So if it comes like a four wheel drive car, after the gearbox, you have to have a tra uh, uh, transfer case. So if you are having transfer case, if you do not manufacture in similar to this way, if you do not believe uh, manufacture it as three components, right? Then you will end up actually having, uh, if you, uh, you will end up actually having an issue. The reason being, uh, you have to manufacture a particular a gearbox for each application. So with the four wheel drive and without the four wheel drive. To avoid that, uh, you can actually have something like that and add components in the back to make sure the vehicle is actually getting a uh, proper uh, uh, in, order, in order to get the proper uh, sorry in order to get the proper gear ratios just give me one second So I hope you understood the reason for having these three components and I expect you will be using these correct terms next time when you are in the classroom. Okay, removing the transmission. So removing the transmission is not a big deal. It's a simple task. Uh, in order to remove transmission, as I told you earlier, you need to understand what sort of a transmission you are actually having. So what's our, whatever the type of a transmission you are actually having, first thing is to remove anything coming connected to the transmission. That includes, uh, that includes the drive shaft, shifter mechanism, or uh, propeller shaft or anything like this. In these two uh, images shown here is actually, uh, you actually have to remove the, you actually have to remove the, Properly shaft only. Then after that, you can actually start using the bell housing bolt. So, uh, as you can see over here, the bell housing bolts are going around the bell housing. Bell housing bolts are going around the bell housing this way. So first you start from the bottom of the bell housing, and finally you remove the bolts on the top of the bell housing, and in an application like this shown in the bill, uh, which below. So there's something called a transmission tunnel in a vehicle where the bell, uh, transmission sits behind the firewall. So uh, oh, underneath the firewall, yeah, you can say underneath the firewall. So uh, it's very hard to reach these two bolts up, uh, upper bolts. So most of the time manufacturers try to reduce the number of bolts on top of it. 
but uh, in some cases it's not possible so for example here there are two bolts in such case it's impossible to reach them from the top of the engine bay so somewhere around here or in if that's not a way it's not possible the in some vehicles they have access panels inside the vehicle or you can actually just use a uh, extend extension uh, extended tools extended box uh, extended socket wrenches and you can actually remove so after removing all the bolts slowly wiggling the transmission out you can actually take it out but uh, before you do any of those things you actually have to make sure you have properly uh, supported the transmission because this is heavy component Right, so what I did was uh, I actually included the two videos which actually showing how to remove the transmission step by step on a front uh, engine rear wheel drive layout and a front engine front wheel drive layout. So once you come to the factory, I expect you have been, when you're coming to the factory, I expect you will be, you will be thoroughly uh, knowledgeable about this so i don't actually have to explain how to do it you i will just give you the vehicle you just take the transmission out that's what i actually expect from you guys to do once you come to the faculty so because of that i highly suggest you to go through these uh, videos i am actually support providing you uh removing the automatic transmission more or less the same except for one uh, single uh, one single step. Uh, you remove drive shaft and propeller shaft and everything. Uh, in addition, after that, uh, before you actually remove the bolts that holding the uh, bell housing, first thing you need to do is you need to actually find the access panel which provide you access to the flywheel, right? You provide the flywheel and uh, torque converter bolt. So in automatic transmission, unlike in the uh, unlike in the manual transmission, you could not actually pull it out unless you completely remove uh, release the torque converter bolts. So in order to do that, there's a small opening, small opening somewhere around here, somewhere near to here, or the access, if there's no access around it, they on, then only solution is to actually uh, remove this start motor and then you will actually have enough access over here. So after uh, removing that, you will get the access necessary to remove the uh, bolts which is actually holding it. So again, in order to explain this more thoroughly with uh, proper tools and equipment, I actually attached a video here because I don't have any uh, enough tools to actually do it at home. So I hope you will go through this, but uh, here only front engine rear wheel drive layout only shown here. It doesn't matter the layout, only the difference is actually this removing the uh, torque converter board. So torque converter, since uh, automatic engines are getting a torque converter, which is a heavy component, they actually do not need a flywheel. They actually use something called a uh, flex plate, which is a thinner, uh, lighter version of the flywheel, which is actually the mid part of the uh, midsection of the trans or flywheel or the flex plate is actually made of uh, thin, not thin actually, sheet metal. So that's why it's actually has a flex plate because it's, it can be flexed. But not while engine is working. Huh? 
So afterwards, uh, you can actually disassemble the engine. So sorry, gearbox. So in disassembling the engine, yeah, sorry, gearbox again, gearbox. Uh, when it comes to the gearbox disassembly, there are two ways you can actually do the disassembling part. It's all down to how the gearbox is actually constructed. So there are two construction types used in gearboxes. So one is actually front or back opening is there. Either opening is there's an opening from the front side. That means uh, where the bell housing is actually bolting, or it's actually from the back of the gearbox house. So where the extension house is bolted. Or if these, if both of these are not available, then you have a split type. So uh, something where you have to actually remove the bolts around the belt, bell housing from top and sorry around the gearbox. So this way and that. From top and bottom, from top and bottom, then you can actually split open the gearbox completely, right? So it doesn't matter. Usually, it's easy to actually work with the split type gearboxes, but uh, nowadays, uh, use of split type uh, gearboxes are getting scarce. Mostly, uh, these front and back open type gearboxes are now coming in days. So gearbox uh, housing is actually this transmission or gearbox housing is actually made of aluminium or cast aluminium or cast steel. So if it is cast aluminium, it's always very advisable to uh, be uh, check the torque specs before you fix it back because it's very easy to damage or very easy to strip the uh, threads of aluminium housing. So if you do that, it's very difficult to fix it back. So it's always a good thing to, again, look into the workshop manual. So yeah, assembling and disassembling processes, I, what I did was I as a, uh, added two, uh, two videos for assembling and disassembling process of the auto gearbox and the manual gearbox. And second one should be manual gearbox, which is auto gearbox. So I fixed that. So. Uh, make sure you watch these things uh, before you come to the classroom next Tuesday because I have a set of questions you have to answer on the spot, right? So, yeah, uh, these uh, videos actually go through very details, but uh, make sure to remember that uh, the uh, specifications or dimensions, especially in the units, units wise, these guys are mostly using imperial units which we are not in use of uh, imperial units we stop using imperial units but for some reason us is still using uh, imperial units so most of these videos are actually coming from us so because of that uh, they actually have these imperial units videos so unfortunately we don't have a uh, i didn't find any other video which have um, si units so because of that I suggest you to just go through them. Uh, just forget about the units, just uh, follow the steps. You just have to understand the steps and any other additional information they throw or discuss about the type of gearboxes and any bearing types. So why each type of bearing is used? What is the purpose of the thrust bearing? What's the purpose of a needle bearing? These things will be discussed here. So I hope you will go through these things and um, you come to the class next day because I'm going to have a small quiz from these videos based on these videos. So you have to answer at the class time, right? During the class time, you actually have to answer this not some time later. Um, speaking of the quiz, uh, I received some emails regarding uh, not being able to uh, getting into quiz and uh, not being able to answer the quiz and everything. The thing is, quiz was open for only for one day. I told you that uh, it will be finished with the, by this time. So if you could not answer by then, um, I don't have any solution. So that the reason being is, yeah. Yeah, so, I hope you will be able to answer the next uh, next quiz at least without any problem. Yeah.